higher education then is uh, a massive privilege. It was one that I was very fortunate enough to do uh, myself. Um, and it's really, really exciting. I was really jealous uh, of all the students at this time of year because they start to get to think about what amazing things they might go on and do. And the possibilities are pretty endless. So really this evening is trying to help you begin to think about how you navigate that, the big, exciting decisions. Uh, and we're going to try and give you what we hope is some really helpful information um, and some to take away with you in terms of how this works, what to think about, what key questions to ask yourself. Um, and as I say, I hope you find the evening uh, really helpful. So when thinking about uh, how I might introduce uh, this evening to you, I thought I took a little bit of a trip down memory lane. And uh, for those uh, older members of the audience, um, this, was, uh, this was my trip down memory lane. So in 1992, uh, at the age of 18, uh, I very much looked like this lady in the middle here with the dungarees and the DMs on. Uh, and I uh, was thinking about going to university. I didn't have a mobile phone, I didn't have an email uh, account, those were not, uh, you couldn't do virtual tours of universities or anything like that. Um, but it was a really, really exciting uh, time. Um, and there are lots of things uh, that went really brilliantly for me, but there were loads and loads of things that I wish someone had told me. So in having that little trip down memory lane, I thought, well, what is it that uh, I could share with you about my own journey that might give you uh, a few uh, thoughts about the kind of things that you really do need to do quite a lot looking into, which perhaps uh, I didn't. Um, when I thought about what helped me, though, the really positive things, it was really around confidence uh, and uh, someone helping me make those applications. And there were two key groups of people who helped me. One was the staff at the college that I went to, uh, but also my parents were really, really instrumental in that as well. Um, so for those of you uh, sitting in the audience uh, with your parents this evening, uh, they are your critical partners. Uh, they're going to ask you maybe some, some difficult questions, but they're all questions that are really important to help you think about your journey going forward. So uh, critical partners, uh, all the people who are in the room today, the college, the students, uh, the parents, it's that sort of triangle of support that we need uh, to make work in order to kind of get you where you need to go. Um, as I said, I'm always really jealous. You have really, really exciting uh, decisions ahead of you, lots and lots of opportunities. Um, but when I thought about my own experience then, I thought it was worth sharing just one thing very briefly with you, because I made a really classic rookie error uh, when I made an application uh, to university, which could easily, easily have been avoided. Uh, I put down my first choice of university in a city that I had never been to, uh, in a university that I had never visited, um, and uh, at the time the reason why I did that was because I was told reliably that it was supposed to be the best history uh, degree course in the country, so I thought, all oh, right, I better, I better apply for that one, that's fine, I'll go for that. Um, I was really miserably unhappy during my first term, uh, it wouldn't have been the right choice, choice for me, and had I done more careful research, um, I would have made a very different decision. Had I gone and had a look, had I got a feel for it, had I asked some of the questions that Louise is going to prompt you with uh, this evening, I'm pretty sure I would have made a more sensible decision. Now, fortunately for me, it wasn't a disaster. I transferred to another university, which I absolutely loved, um, and one which had the kinds of things that I knew for me personally, and it is a very individual choice, uh, were going to be the sorts of things that made me feel comfortable and supportive and, and really excited about my degree. But if I transferred to a different university in today's world, that would have potentially cost me over £9,000. So this is really, really, really important. You need this. Going to university is really exciting. Uh, it's absolutely worthwhile doing. But it's really, really important, both for your own happiness, but also uh, financially, to make sure that this is a decision that you think through really carefully. Uh, so, Exeter College, we really, really enjoy uh, sharing all of this with you. Students are really well supported by uh, Louise and her team, uh, and also by personal tutors. Um, and this year we sent uh, over um, a thousand UCAS applications off, uh, and uh, many of our students are excitedly now uh, finishing off their A-levels and IB and all sorts of other BTEC qualifications uh, in order to secure their places. What you can see here is the range of things that our students go on to do. Um, so this is just a kind of little snapshot um, those sorts of things. So we've had students go off for medicine, anthropology, music, um, politics, philosophy and economics. Uh, Tom here on the end uh, and his brother are both studying that at Oxford University. Uh, artificial intelligence. We've had students go off to the London School of Fashion to do fashion management. Uh, aerospace engineering, speech and language therapy. I could have kind of gone on for many, many pages. There are really, really exciting range of things out there to do. Um, and we will support students both in the UK and to go abroad in, in any area that they're interested in exploring. 
Um, and lots and lots of success. Hundreds of our students go off to what are considered to be uh, the top Russell Group universities, if that's something that you're keen to do, or if you're interested in, in Oxbridge, or if you're interested in uh, medical applications, uh, there'll be information uh, as you go out in the careers um, fair area um, to support you with that. Martin Gilbert's uh, our key um, support uh, on that area. So whatever your ambitions are, whether they be any of those things up there or something totally different, at somewhere totally different, uh, we're here to help you uh, in that process and we're really, really excited uh, and looking forward to working with you on that. The final thing I want to say though before I move on uh, and hand over to uh, Louise is just to say that increasingly, and this certainly wasn't something uh, that was an option that was open to me many, many years ago, um, but increasingly a lot of our uh, students uh, after their level three study, so whether that be A levels, uh, the International Baccalaureate or uh, BTEC level three uh, extended diplomas, go off to do uh, high level apprenticeships uh, and apprenticeships uh, as an alternative to university. Louise is going to give you a little bit of information about that. There are other people here this evening who can do that as well. So whilst today is predominantly going to be focused on universities, this is something, if you're interested in certain areas and certain careers, it's really worth looking at. So uh, Rosalie here was part of our um, REACH Academy. Uh, she did extremely well in her A-levels. Um, she's now living in London in a shared flat. She's working for Ernst & Young as an apprentice. And in five years, she's going to be uh, a chartered accountant. Um, and she's having the time of her life. So there are lots and lots of different ways uh, in and lots and lots of things uh, to think about. So I hope you have a really good evening. I hope it's lots and lots of information. We're here for questions at the end uh, and I'll just hand over to Lewis. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Um, right, so I thought it would be useful just a bit of a recap on what your students, your sons and daughters have experienced today. They've all had an inspirational talk all about careers in 2025, so they'll be 25 in 2025. And what will be around them? What will opportunities look like for them job-wise? Well, there'll be lots of opportunities in bioscience, renewables, uh, high-tech engineering, and my favourite are the open bionics, the bionic arms. They can see their prosthetics. You can have one, phrase and character, Star Wars. These were created by a young person like you who done a three-year degree in robotics and in his bedroom he came up with these designs because prosthetics weren't very sophisticated for hands and he created much more flexibility in gripping fingers. And he basically created whole new hands by using 3D printing technology and it made it much cheaper and a much more successful process. And he's gone from running in his bedroom to now running a multi-million pound business providing affordable hands for young people. So this could be you. So, what do these all have in common, though, these jobs that are going to exist in 2025? Well, they're all going to require higher level skills. So the jobs for the lower skilled and medium skilled level may be replaced by technology, as we know this is already happening in some areas. Um, the transformation, um, we've seen of Uber and apps that have you know, transformed certain areas. This will continue to happen. So it's really important when you're thinking about what you're going to do next, so you're making sure you're sort of future-proofing your career by being aware of where the opportunities could be. Okay? So, you've pretty much got two choices. Now, you could do a gap year at any point. You could do a gap year next year, you could do a gap year after a degree, you could do a gap year when you're 50, my age. I always like the idea of doing one. But ultimately, the choice is really of going into work and doing an apprenticeship, that's where most of the opportunities are now through apprenticeships, not so much as jobs, at all going into higher education. Now, of course, you could do an apprenticeship and then go into higher education. I sometimes see people who've gone into higher education, sadly, invested in three years of a degree, and then had to pay to do an apprenticeship because um, they sadly then realised that actually they wanted to be a stonemason and they didn't really want to follow their English degree. So it's really important to um, think about that in which order you might want to do things. So obviously, as Emma said, the choices are vast. You know, from the choices that you've had with A level and IB, you're suddenly looking at potentially doing a choice of 50,000 different courses at university, over 200 different apprenticeships, and hundreds of different kind of gap year combinations, leading to jobs where we know some of them exist, but some we yet to know what they will be. So we can see that it is quite complex. Uh, and we're aware that, you know, it can feel a bit overwhelming, these sorts of choices. So that's why we're here to help. Um, I thought it would be useful to focus on apprenticeships because I went to a conference um, about a month ago um, organised by The Times and also a group called High Flyers. 
who do work with graduate recruiters and employers to look at what they're looking for, but also what the trends are around recruitment of graduates and young people. So I thought it'd be best to share this with you because obviously some of you will be thinking about working for those large graduate employers and it's important to know sort of what they're looking for. So uh, one of the things that was interesting was the focus on apprenticeships. Now as you can see, the number of apprenticeships in 2007 were under 200,000 and this number has practically doubled, uh, almost 500,000. Bit of a dip um, since 2012 but it's on the rise. And the government's got a target um, of basically getting more young people doing apprenticeships. They want um, 3 million by 2020, between now and then, young people to start doing apprenticeships. <laughs> and how they're doing this is they're incentivising companies. So large companies, they've created a levy, a tax, based on their payroll. And if they don't take on so many apprentices for the size of their company, then they will tax them. So what you've got is some companies now looking very closely at their graduate, their apprenticeship scheme because they're looking at developing these schemes uh, because they have to. Um, and some of them are shifting recruitment from graduates to 18-year-olds that they can mould. And I'll come on a bit to that later on. But you can see it's a growing area. Um, apprenticeships have changed somewhat since we were younger. If you were a product of the 80s, even before the 1992, and you went to university at that point, you would have probably found that the apprenticeship that was offered, the YTS scheme, was nothing like the apprenticeships that are being offered now. We almost have to forget they even existed. Because if you are an apprentice now, you are employed. You are paid £3.50 is the minimum an apprentice will earn for the first year, but if they're over 18 the second year, they'll be on the minimum wage. But so many companies pay so much more than that. Today we had some apprentices in, we've got some from Ernst & Young you can talk to after this, and also some Exeter College XA level students are doing apprenticeships. And you'll find that they're earning considerably more than that, so between 13 and £20,000 a year. So it's, it's definitely not a poor relation in terms of the money. The other thing is, of course, is that an employer will pay for you to do your training. Um, and so chances are that they will also offer you employment at the end, so you're not incurring any sort of fees. Parents often ask me about the levels, and there's a little bit of confusion about the levels, because you would assume, wouldn't you, that if you had done A-levels, that you would automatically maybe start on a higher or a degree apprenticeship. And whilst that is the case for some organisations, it's not necessarily the case in certain industries where it's really important to start at the beginning and work your way up. So, for example, if you were interested in accountancy and AAT, whatever level you come in, everyone has to do level two. You might fast track through it, but everyone works their way up. And that is the great thing about apprenticeships, no matter what level you come in, you can work your way up. So I was with some young people today and talking to them and they're planning on working their way up. They've just gone through level 2 AAT, gone to level 3 and they're working their way up to chartered status. So they'll be fully qualified. Um, and the other thing is that some of the higher apprenticeships require you to have had experience in the industry. So for example in construction, where a lot of people do the apprenticeship route in construction management, they would expect at a higher level that you had some experience supervising and managing other people, which obviously as an A-level student you're not going to have straight away. So this is sort of how it looks in terms of the numbers of people doing apprenticeships. So you can say, who would say that apprenticeships are just for the young? Um, the bulk of apprenticeships are actually done by people over 25 at the moment. So parents, you can't say career change, it's possible. Um, and you can see as well that um, the, numbers, the, the numbers doing the level two, the intermediate apprenticeship, are actually um, higher as well at the moment. And the higher and degree apprenticeships, although we're talking about them today as if they're an equal option as going to university, it's actually a small number of people doing them currently, 27,000 compared to the 500,000 people doing apprenticeships. So last year, there were 1,800 18-year-olds who started doing higher degree apprenticeships compared to the 235,000 who went to university. So you can see it's a route still yet to be developed. But I thought you'd like to see which companies were actually developing these opportunities. So this is the full list of the large, uh, well-known brand names uh, who are first to the 
post, as it were, in developing their higher and degree apprenticeships. This is all of them. So this thing does include some school leaver schemes and some sponsored degree schemes, because some of these employers like KPMG, Pricewaterhouse, uh, Ernst & Young, they had their schemes running way before the government uh, made you know, encourage them. You see the civil service is the biggest employer, 725 vacancies they have this year. Um, but you can also see people like the BBC have 32 vacancies. And what was interesting with talking to them was that actually it might be easier to get in through a fast track apprenticeship, say for the civil service or the BBC or IBM at 18 than it would be as a graduate. Partly because other people don't know about it yet. So the competition isn't as high. It's incredible the number of applications there are for these companies as a graduate. The, the numbers that they recruit are hardly any bigger than this. So it's worth considering. So let me show you. So these are the people who are offering degree apprenticeships. So you can see they've got BT, BA Systems, the Navy, Jaguar Land Rover, GCHQ. So a lot of these are in IT, management, finance, engineering, they're the areas, um, some for the BBC, but um, not so many within the civil service, there's some communications and media, uh, but not so many in that area. Banking, higher apprenticeships, so construction, as we said, Balfour BT, engineering, Airbus, and the school leaver programmes are the historical ones they've already had set up for quite a while, like IBM, KPMG, Ernst & Young, and the sponsored degree schemes still exist. So you'll be able to look back at this presentation and have a look and um, see and do a bit of research on these if you're interested. It's worth bearing in mind that if you want to apply for one of these schemes, a bit like UCAS and the competitive universities, you have to do your research over the summer and be prepared to put in an application in the autumn or January. So they're not recruiting necessarily <coughs> towards the end of the year, they'll be recruiting at the same time as you might be applying for UCAS. So you might decide to double up and you know, apply for a degree apprenticeship or university. Now, we talked about higher level skills. Well, these are some of the apprenticeships that are coming on stream very shortly. They've been approved, um, and you can see that there's some here that you wouldn't normally expect. Potentially, you would think that they would be people who would have to have a degree. Uh, and they're very, very specific to specific areas. Um, you know, here we've got nuclear scientists. And this year I met a student um, who was a really bright science student at the college, about to do their A-levels, really excited because they've got um, an apprenticeship, degree apprenticeship with Pfizer, a big pharmaceutical company, and they're going off to Kent to go and live in a student house that Pfizer had put together with all their apprentices, their 50 degree apprenticeships, and they were going to do their science and pharmaceutical course what, through Pfizer. So you can see that things like solicitor and law, you'd assume you have to go to university to do that. But actually, it can be quite expensive doing that route and quite tricky. And it might actually be easier to look at doing law through an apprenticeship. <coughs> so some of these things that were, these professionalisation of these courses that were delivered through the university are now being delivered by the employer. And people like Dyson, um, they're actually thinking, you know what, we're fed up, the universities aren't giving us what we want. We're going to set up our own university. So they've actually applied to the government, the government have changed the law and there'll be a Dyson University. They're recruiting for this year, but they can't actually set it up themselves. They're having to be in combination with Warwick University. But they're thinking, why don't we get the young people, mould them, give them the skills, and they're going to be doing that in engineering, and finance and IT. So it does make it a bit more complicated when you're doing your research, because it's not just a question of just looking on UCAS at uni, so it may be actually doing a bit of digging down and seeing if there are any companies out there that might have what you're looking for. Now, if you're thinking, I don't necessarily want to move away from home, I'm not sure about going to work for a big brand company that's in London or north of England, actually I want to stay around here. Well, Exeter College, we've got over 45 different types of advanced and higher level apprenticeships that we offer in a massive range of areas. And today you can even speak to some of these students who are here um, upstairs in the foyer this evening. You can have a chat after this about them. They all went to Exeter College, they all did A-levels, and now they're working for companies locally doing their apprenticeship. So, chance to do a bit more research and find out about what they're doing and how it's going for them. Okay, so that's the apprenticeship option. I thought I'd mention that to you because it's becoming much more significant, and I think it will continue to become significant. However, 
the bulk of students from Exeter College and from all other colleges and schools who do A-levels currently go on to university. So in this section we're going to kind of be looking at uh, resources that can help you. It may be, for example, that you have a very strong idea about what kind of job you want to do after university. You may know a sector or you may have a specific job in mind. Alternatively, you may have no idea at all. That's absolutely fine. We'll deal with both of them. Okay, what about if you know what you want to do after university? So you may have a specific subject that you're going to do to prepare you for a job. Now, um, I met a student the other day and he'd chosen accountancy. And he was quite miffed, actually, because he got to the end of his degree and he just assumed that his accountancy degree would give him exemptions to um, the chartered status and make it easier for him in employment. But what he found was that his course, the way it had been structured, didn't do that. And some of his friends who had done a different course in business, or even called accountancy, had exemptions as part of their course. So it's really important if you're thinking, I'm going to take law, I'm going to take psychology, it's definitely going to lead to those career areas, that you actually drill down into the content of the course. Is it accredited by the professional organisation? It needs to be accredited by like the British Psychological Society, or it's the law, it's LLB. Is, is it got enough of the content? Uh, sometimes when people combine courses as well, then they might lose some of the content, which may make it harder to progress on. So check that out. And um, also work placements. Another thing these graduate employers said was 70% of our recruitment is from people who've done a work placement. So even if um, you know you, you've chosen a course that's business, does it have a work placement as part of the course? It's definitely worth considering ones that do and asking them what kind of opportunities there are, because a lot of people then find it easier to get a job afterwards. You might have opportunities to study or work abroad, so it's the kind of things that you need to be finding out. Now, sometimes people get very focused on if a university is a Russell Group university. I would suggest that you don't look so much at the university as the course at the university. We've all been in, in great places, haven't we? Great schools, even next to college maybe, where some of the teachers are outstanding and maybe some of them don't quite float your boat. So it's really important that you drill down and look at the course and the reputation of that course with employers or for studying on, onwards. And I can, I'll come on to how you can find that out in a minute. The other thing is, is don't assume the number of places on the course necessarily matches vacancies in the workplace. Uh, a course will recruit because it's popular. So 400, you know, 40,000 people do a media-related course this year. There are less than 400 paid media graduate jobs available. So, you know, to just bear that in mind when you're doing your research. Now, I thought you might find this interesting. Uh, this is a slide, when the um, companies go round on these milk rounds and they recruit for graduate place, uh, graduates every year, there are some universities that they visit more than others, and this was their list of the most popular ones. You would expect Oxford and Cambridge probably to be number one and two, but actually the top three were Warwick, Manchester and Bristol. Okay, so just give you an idea of what employers are like. I was trying to drill down and wonder if it's because they have more vocational courses or what it was about those students, because some places they really say, we like students from this university. What was it about that? But I couldn't actually get to grips with it. So you might want to have a look. This, obviously, these slides will be for you to look at later. What about if you've got no idea what you want to do after university? Maybe I've got an idea what you're going to do at university yet. Don't panic. Um, for 70% of graduate jobs, it doesn't matter what subject you've done. So you can do something you like and you're good at and have a passion for and not necessarily worry about exactly where it's heading as long as you know you're looking for higher level skills. Choose a subject you're passionate about and you're going to do well at and you'll get a 2 1, get a good degree, and then you'll have lots of opportunities. The most important thing, though, is that you start researching now what you can do with a degree in that subject. And I'll come to where you can find that information out in a minute. The other thing was, um, is we're speaking to the students today at my speed meet, where I had lots of students from different universities. Some of them were doing English and history, and they were sort of saying, oh, I'm using the summer, this summer, my second year, to do a variety of different work experiences because I'm not sure exactly what area I want to go into. But what is important with employers is that it's relevant. So just working in Waitrose, for example, over the summer to earn some money might not be enough if you're then looking at going into um, law or something else, they'll want a related work experience. So it's important, even if you're doing a non-specific degree, that you're still doing that in your holidays 
And the universities can help you do this, so you don't have to do it all on your own. It's really important you get involved in extracurricular activities, and I'll come on to that in a second, and that you use, you know, you're paying £50,000 potentially for this course, so it's really important you use, use the career service. There's loads of people like me, for example, Exeter University has a fantastic team of people, and some students just don't choose to engage with those people, but they're there, they're running workshops, they can help you run things on interview skills, and they can, um, they're bringing people for talks, and to really support you with your thinking about what you're going to do next. So make sure you do that when you go to uni. So what kind of experiences do students have at uni? So these are all the kind of things that can help enhance your CV, that make you more employable. Um, when I spoke to the employers, they said it's really important that you run a society. It wasn't enough to be a part of a society. So I suggest if you're interested in tiddlywinks or poker or whatever it is, taekwondo, if there isn't a group, you set one up and then you're responsible for chairing that group and the finance of <coughs> that group and then you can put that on your application forms. But you can see that people have such a broad range of experiences at university and employers are really looking for a well-rounded person so it's really important to get look at the universities and see what they have to offer. Okay, so let's have a look at some useful resources that are going to help you decide what you're going to study and where. Too many students um, come and see me and they say, oh, I found this course. I say, oh, where did you find it? And they say, oh, I Googled it. And so that shows that the university's marketing is really working because obviously their search engine optimization means that they're right at the top of the pile. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's the full extent of the courses that are available or that's the best course for you. So UCAS has all the courses on that. That's where every single degree course is. So you really need to go onto the UCAS website and apply the filters. You can apply filters to the actual course content or where you're going to live. Uh, whether you want to work, go to Scotland or Wales or England, um, and then you can start to refine um, the searches and have a look at and drill down into the entry criteria and the course content. Then, of course, you can go onto the website and then you'll see the glossy marketing and how wonderful. I went to Bradford University, I was really impressed by the trees. I only went to visit when it was covered in snow. <laughs> Marvellous. This one tree they had, they took photographs of it from lots of different angles. So um, make sure, um, of course, that you, you have a look. Now, another really good website, uh, I wish I'd had something like this when, when we were looking, we might not have made, I made a mistake as well when I chose my university course, might not have made that mistake, is Unistats. Fantastic website, enables you to get up side by side the different university <coughs> courses and compare them. Look at the student satisfaction. Anything under 80% is probably not that good because most of them have over 90. But you can actually look at like what the IT resources were like, what the teaching was like, what the students saying about the course. And this is totally impartial. Then you can see how the course is delivered. So whether it's lectures, exams, and also the structure of the assessment, exams, coursework, you can start to see what will suit you. What are the entry criteria they normally offer on, but what do they normally accept on, which could be different. Um, also, you can look at um, employability, so you can see are they getting people into jobs in professional areas or are they working in Starbucks at the end? What's the starting salary? What's the salary after three years? So you can start to see, get a picture and see, is this good value for money in this course? And is it worth them going to have a look, go to an open day and start to find out more about it? Um, I mentioned to you about looking at where courses lead in the future and there's a really great website called Prospects which is a graduate website and you can look at jobs on there but you can also look and see what you can do with a degree in history or geography and it will have a link to case studies as well and then more information about those jobs. And every year Hefke, um, who report on higher education, produce a fantastic report that's just available as a PDF and I don't think it gets enough publicity but it's called What Do Graduates Do? And you can look at graduates generally, what did graduates do last year, where did they go, what sort of jobs they did, but also you can look at what do graduates from English do, what do graduates from sports science do. There's a massive variation in what kind of jobs they go into and what kind of opportunities there are, and the difference between the humanities and the social sciences and the sciences, and you may be surprised as well, it's not always exactly what you expect, so I really recommend looking at those things when you're, if you're a bit undecided between um, some subjects. Okay, now student finance sometimes isn't really discussed until after you've decided your courses. But I think that's a bit of a mistake because every year I see somebody who signed up to go to a court place 
And then they realised that the loan maybe wasn't as much as they thought it was going to be, and then they're in a bit of a panic about the finances. I think that you should think about the money when you're thinking about where you're going to choose to go. So forearm is forewarned. You know what you've got to play with, because it's different for everyone. So everybody is entitled to tuition fees. Tuition fee loan, £9,250 currently at most places. Some places are slightly cheaper than that. For example, if you were to do your course at Exeter College, um, it's significantly cheaper. But if you're going to go to a, one of those lots of group universities, that's how much you'll pay a year. So the money is paid straight to the university. It doesn't go anywhere in your bank account, sadly. Um, and then you don't pay it off until you've completed your course. And I'll talk to you about repayments in a second. Now, all students are entitled to some non-assessed maintenance loan, and that's about 3,900 at the moment. So that's everybody, no matter what your household income is. But if you want more than that, the higher amount, that will depend on your household income. Now, the definition of household is the parent that you live with. So if you live with both your parents, it's their joint income. If you just live with your dad, it's just your dad's. If you live with your dad and your stepmom, it's their income. Okay, so that's the sort of how it works on mum and partner, all those things. It's their household income. And also the amount you get depends on whether you're living at home, living away from home outside of London, and then living in London, which is obviously considerably more expensive, so you get a bigger loan. So just to see what that kind of looks like for you, um, let's take the living away from home outside of London option. Now, if you're earning, if your household income is £25,000 a year or less, then you will get the maximum loan, which is currently £58,500 a year. You will also, because your household income is up to £25,000, be able to apply for all the bursaries that the universities offer. And some of these are really generous, and they can be as much as £1,500 cash in your pocket a year. They can be, um, they used to be like free accommodation for a year. They were very, very generous and they really vary. So um, sometimes they will give bursaries up to a higher amount of money. In London, I think sometimes if your household income's up to £40,000, you might be able to get a bursary. Now they're awarded by the uni and that's free money. You don't have to pay it back. So when you're doing your searching for courses, look at bursaries too. Might as well look at the free money. Now, as you can see, as your household income goes up, the loan goes down. And um, so you can see that it's not really a level playing field. And anyone who knows Martin, money saving expert, um, he campaigns about this issue because he calls it the parental gap. Because the government say everyone can go, they don't say parents, you have to pay, there's no expectation on parents to pay, but then the person whose household income is 70,000, uh, they may have big mortgages, may have lots of children, they have lots of costs, they might not be expecting to pay this money, they might not have been saving up to pay it, and suddenly um, their, their son or daughter will get half, pretty much, of what the person on 25,000 will get. So you need to be thinking about this because the maintenance loan, the biggest chunk of that will go on accommodation costs. And it's not a level playing field, is it, in terms of cost of living, wherever you go. Some places are incredibly expensive to live, and some places aren't. Now, I did a little survey. I only went to a few places because I've been here all day. Um, but I looked at the cheapest accommodation in halls of residence um, at some random particular universities to see um, how much it was a week. Now, you can see that different, when you're researching your university, some universities will charge you for longer than you're actually there. So although it's a, maybe a 30 week term, they might charge you for 39 weeks or 40 weeks. So you need to bear that in mind when you're looking at the cost. And all this information is usually on, I just got this from their websites. Um, so you can see that in London, it's obviously, as you'd expect, more expensive, but you get a bigger loan to offset that. But obviously if you're moving into private rented in London, it could be considerably more maybe. You can see that um, the cheapest places that I found, I mean, I didn't go right to the north of England or Scotland, but were the Midlands. And the Midlands is pretty cheap, I have to say. My older son is at Warwick, went to Warwick, and the younger one went to Loughborough. And that was partly because when we were, search, when we were searching for courses, I looked at affordability, um, because out of his 3,900 loan, he can cover all his accommodation costs. And then, of course, people make up the gaps by part-time jobs, 
So if you've got a part-time job now or over the summer, you can be saving your own money for university for next year. Um, and also parents maybe help out a bit. I used to help out with my son's mobile phone bill because I always wanted him to be able to phone home. But maybe that you've got an uneconomic mobile phone contract and I made him renegotiate to a cheaper one. So you, you know, if you have this information now, then you can start to make plans. Okay, so one option would be, of course, to stay at home and do a course at Exeter College because, of course, that would reduce your costs. And we offer a really vast range of different degree courses and HMDs and foundation degrees and a big range of subjects. Uh, we have lots of students here who have done, gone through the courses and have lots of positive things to say about it. Obviously, you know the lecturers, you might know the people who are teaching you these courses, and there's quite a lot of support as well in terms of um, the actual, um, that you'll get during your course. And Exeter College degree um, studies people are here tonight in the fair if you want to speak to them. And they do actually have an open event coming up um, next week, on this time next week actually, on the 20th of June. So you can pop along and find out more about it if that's something that appeals to you. Okay, so we've looked at what things you need to do to research your courses, to get your shortlist, and they're things that you should be doing over the summer. So when you come back in September, then you're ready to do a UCAS application. So UCAS is all online, so your, UK, your university application is all online through UCAS. And we register everybody at the beginning of the autumn term. So when you come back, pretty much on day one, day two, uh, yep. before teaching starts. Before actually, teaching starts, yeah. we will register you for UCAS. And so you'll start the application process. We give you a buzzword. It means that then we can see your form, so we can help you double check it, and your tutor can see your form, and so we can help you build, because the tutor has to put your reference on there and your expected grades, and we can double check and make sure it's all correct before we send it. You can apply for up to five choices, and you can only submit one UCAS form during the year. I've always asked if people can submit three because they can't make up their mind about the course. It should have, the course that you choose should be similar. So the five that you choose shouldn't be like five totally different random courses, they should actually be similar course. And the cost of five is £24 and one is 14 which is frankly very good value for money. If you apply in America, you have to pay sort of $70, $80 at least for each application. Um, the universities, unlike in the old days, we filled out a form and you had to put them in order. You don't have to do that anymore. They can't see where else you've applied to. So that's pretty good. And also, um, once you've completed the form, make sure you let your tutor know so they can check and add your reference. They have 10 working days to do that. Okay. So don't expect them to immediately be able to turn around in 24 hours. And once you've done that, then you can pay with a debit card. And um, we will also check, we'll at that point check and send your form to UCAS for you. So once you've paid, it doesn't go anywhere until we've double checked it and made sure it's all correct before we send it. Because once you've sent it, you can't bring it back. Yeah. Um, when, when do you actually have to send that form in? Is that actually in the autumn or is it? Oh, I'm coming on to that. So that's good. Very good question. Very good question. I'll, I'll just put you to talk about the personal statement and I'll come on to that. So something the personal statement is an area that people find a bit tricky. That's part of the UCAS application form. It's 4,000 characters, pretty much one side of A4. Please, please, when you're writing this, don't do it in the UCAS application because it will time you out and it has no grammar or spell check. It's much better to do it in Word, um, and then it's a draft. You might have to do several drafts, or some people will do about 20 or 30 drafts, hopefully that will be you, but do it as a draft in Word, it's much easier. There's loads of resources on our P&E um, internal portal, on our Moodle, and loads of how-to resources and videos on UCAS TV. They've got some fantastic things I was watching the other day, and also top tips on the student room. The most important thing about the personal statement is you don't copy any of it. Every year I've always got somebody who accidentally copies a few sentences or maybe they weren't very inspired when they wrote it. And they use copycat software at UCAS, so they will find you and then you might not get any offers. So this is one thing where you don't want to collaborate with your best friend. Uh, we offer loads of help around the personal statement. So from the autumn right the way through to the deadline, every single lunchtime we have drop-in sessions where you can literally drop in with your statement or drop in if you don't have any inspiration and we can help you with putting something together. But it's so much easier to write this when you know what course you want to do and where you want to go. It's so hard to do something like this if you haven't actually done any of that exploration. That's why it's so important to do all of the other stuff over the summer. 
Okay, here's the key dates then. So everyone registers in September. Still time to book open days. As Emma said, you know, it's really important. If you're going to spend, invest a lot of money in this course, it's really important that you go and have a look around. Um, and now the open days are probably booking for September, so there will be a raft bef before, they, they tend to be in June and September, so please do have a look and see what you're interested in and book on. Deadline for Oxbridge Medical and Veterinary, 15th of October, so we would, um, those people will be identified to us right at the beginning of the autumn term, and Martin Gilbert will be supporting them with those applications through the process, and we'll be helping and supporting him and double checking all the forms. Um, but they would obviously need to be in way before the October 15th because we have to get the references on. So probably I say come back in September with your personal statement drafted, ready to do your UCAS form. We have an internal deadline of the, about the 28th of September normally. 28th of September. Because we need to turn it around. Um, also, if you're applying for a competitive uni, all unis make offers based on the forms they have in from September. They don't wait for the deadline in January. If you're applying to Bath, Exeter, Bristol, you want to get your form in as soon as possible. So, same thing as the Oxbridge thing, really. I would say by October half term. Also, if you've got A levels, I think the sooner you can get this done, the better, because then you can get on the process of getting the grades and focusing um, rather than letting it all drag, drag on. So, I'd say October half term deadline for competitive applications. We say that if you get your form in by January the 3rd, we will guarantee that it goes by the official UCAS deadline the 15th of January. There's always some people who leave it to the last minute, maybe didn't think they were going to go, change their mind. But that gives you Christmas, and then it gives the tutors 10 days to turn around your efforts. Okay, so that's the deadline, January the 3rd. Then after the 15th of January, all UCAS applications that are received by UCAS after that date are considered late, which means that a university doesn't necessarily have to consider you. And what you find is you just don't hear back from the competitive ones. They just think that sometimes you're waiting and waiting and waiting. Um, and it could be like March, April, and you still haven't heard. And it might be, they might make you an offer, but they might not. So why take a chance? Sometimes get your application on the 4th, 15th of January. Even if you have offers, you're not committed to going. You know, you can defer it if you decide you want to take a gap year, um, or you can pull out at any point. No one's going to make you go. And the money doesn't actually go across the student finance until you actually start and you actually enrol at the university on the day you enrol. So you really have nothing to lose by putting the UCAS application in, even if you're not sure. Okay, so um, some people I know are thinking of a gap year. I just wanted to flag up this particular website for you. Um, it's on the information sheet that you've all got on your desk, independent gap year advice. But with gap years, um, sometimes when you Google them, you can find any old gap year company out there who will take your money and maybe not look after you on a gap year and can't guarantee the quality. Uh, this website's put together by a chap who's got a 30 years experience. It's got a database on here of over 100 different gap year organisations with tried and trusted gap years. So if you're thinking about a gap year, independent gap year price. Okay. Um, if you want some more information after today about all the options <coughs> open to you, um, excellent website also on here is Career Pilot. Um, looks at all the options, has fantastic links, uh, really can't recommend it enough, and um, also a parent zone, which answers lots and lots of um, good advice about frequently asked, asked questions. So there's bound to be a question, if you've got a question, where they've actually got the answer for you. Okay. So um, I'm around at the end if you've got any questions. I'm going to hand back to Emma to finish off. Thank you, Rachel. So lo lots of information. Uh, don't panic. We have been recording it. So uh, if there is anything you've missed, obviously pop down and have a chat with Louise uh, or myself uh, at the end or uh, do have another uh, watch there. Um, so I hope you found that really helpful. Lots and lots of different things to think about. Lots of questions to ask yourselves. Um, and you'll do remember that all of you uh, have got a personal tutor um, who will support you with this as well and can point you in the right direction and talk through those different options with you uh, as well. Uh, our tutors are trained uh, to do that and uh, many of them are really, really experienced uh, at supporting people with UCAS applications. So as well as the Reese's team, um, there's also uh, obviously your tutor uh, as well. So uh, before um, just finishing off this part of the evening and, and letting you go and have a chat to some of the universities that we've uh, got lined up for you uh, next door, I think I just wanted to pull out, because there is a lot of information, just a couple of things, uh, pointers really, after years of experience of working with young people uh, on their UCAS applications. I think the first 
is, and I hope this has come across really clearly, and I know Louise has uh, really, really emphasised it, is you must start now looking and researching and taking great care uh, to spend a lot of time looking for all the information and finding out as much as you can. Um, on all the different websites that Louise has recommended, lots and lots of useful ones to start exploring, both from a parent point of view and a student point of view. Um, if you don't use your summer wisely, it becomes very difficult to make a, a careful, thoughtful decision when you come back in September. Um, you might want to make a final decision then, but unless you've done some work towards it, uh, the pressure will start kicking in of the second year of your uh, IB or your A-levels or, or your extended diploma, um, and your deadlines will start looming and it will become very difficult juggle those things. So it's really important now, your tutorials over the next couple of weeks are going to be entirely focused on what it is you think you might want to do and you're going to get lots of support and lots of encouragement to start thinking about that. So use the summer really, really wisely uh, and don't do what I did uh, and uh, just uh, plump for something that uh, someone told you was good. Okay, look really carefully at the course's uh, content, lots and lots of opportunities at different universities. You need to choose something that is exciting, that has really good teaching. Uh, you are paying for this, you must demand really good teaching. Not all universities, uh, despite having fantastic reputations, are necessarily always good teaching universities. And you are going as an undergraduate to be taught. Uh, and to be inspired uh, and to be helped to do really, really well. What you don't want is a university that's totally focused, or a department that's totally focused on their research ratings uh, and not on how good the quality of their teaching is. Uh, and that's really, really important and it's often not where you think. So really do take great care of that. Finances, I think Louise has given you a brilliant flavour of all the sorts of things to have a think about. I wish uh, that someone uh, had given me those sorts of pieces of information, so there's lots there to think about. Um, considering work experience and work shadowing, that's something the reason her team can help you with, that's something your tutors can help you with. If those are the sorts of things that would help you make informed decisions, there's some way you can use your summer really well uh, to have a think about um, exploring some different career options to make sure that this is the right decision for you. Um, and those sorts of things as well that you can put in your personal statement, stuff that makes you stand out from the crowd a little bit, look that bit different from the other applicants. Um, and finally, and I think again, Louise's presentation has gone fantastically through uh, um, some really important information about what will the world look like when I come out the other side of university. I don't think I ever thought about what I was going to do. Uh, 77 degrees, as Louise said, um, give you those higher level skills and lead on to lots and lots uh, of jobs. Um, but if you have something very particular in mind and you don't want to shut certain doors to yourself in terms of your career, very, very important that you start to think about uh, that choice in relation to where you might want to go uh, from there. So really, really